This is a fluoroscopic x-ray pre-surgery. You can see that there's very minimal arthritis, which speaks to uh, this 77-year-old likely not having so much knee pain before she passed. All right, so we're gonna be doing a partial medial knee replacement using ortholine, but what's unique about this procedure is that we're gonna be doing a kinematic partial knee replacement. What's interesting to me is that kinematic alignment, for the most part, has been just discussed in, in circles of total knee replacement, less so with partial knee replacement. I'm not sure why that is, because in some ways, kinematic alignment um, is even more important for a partial knee, and I say that it's more important for a partial knee because in a partial knee, there's retention of the cruciate ligaments, and there's retention of the patellofemoral joint and the contralateral joint. So the better we can imitate and, and copy the original joint line, I think the better we can make implants feel and, and you know, hopefully potentially make uh, implants last. At this point, we're gonna assemble the ortholine instrumentation, which is absolutely essential to do kinematic partial knee replacement. And I'm just gonna pin this into place Yeah, and this is just a ballpark, and because uh, the ortholine will allow us to um, find whatever alignment we want to do, whether it's mechanical or um, kinematic, the fine tuning of it will be done with the manipulation of the jig. So I'm just sliding my finger underneath the jig, just like we do for all ortholine uh, procedures. And now we're going to pin this into place. So you'll notice that I'm, I'm placing two pins here. One is going to be through the medial side, which is ultimately going to get cut, but one is through the lateral side. And, and yes, this is going through the cartilage and this is through the preserved uh, lateral side. And this is an injury to the cartilage that we're creating, but the size of this pin is about three millimeters. It's extremely tiny. And I would just remind everyone that sometimes when, even when we do osteochondral autograft transfers, we're taking bone plugs that are sometimes greater than seven or eight millimeters. And you know, a lot of clinicians just leave those empty depending on where they are geographically on the femoral condyle. And I would submit that this place on the, the proximal lateral trochlea is a very safe area to have a little hole. Now we're looking at a couple different values. We're looking at flexion extension uh, valgus varus. And we can manipulate all of these things independently uh, using ortholine systems. So the first thing I'm gonna modify is the flexion extension. And generally, I want this to be at neutral. And that looks good. Now, in terms of varus valgus, this is where it gets kinematic. Generally, this varus valgus is in relationship to the uh, mechanical axis. You'd want this to be uh, zero if you were doing a mechanical axis cut. But we're going to do it kinematically. And so what I'm going to do is register these pads to be parallel to the articulation of the distal femur. Now normally one side is deficient cartilage and the other side isn't. In this case, since both this is a non-arthritic knee, the cartilage is preserved on both sides. And so what I'm simply going to do is to drop this base plate so that both paddles are touching the condyles. Now in situations where there's no cartilage left, you have to take that into account. Generally the thickness of cartilage is about two millimeters. So I'd want for the most lateral paddle to be sitting on the lateral femoral condyle, and I'd want to be about two millimeters of space between the paddle and the, and the medial side. And so you can see here that I've just applied it to the jig, pushing this golden button, the paddles are gonna drop. Now, what's important to notice here is that we have space between the paddle and between the femoral condyle. Now, looking at the jig up top, We can see here valgus is, you know, just as we started, is that seven degree valgus. If we go to a five degree valgus cut, we'll notice that it's a little bit closer. But still, if you look from the side here, you can see that there is absolutely a little daylight there. We're at about three, and I would argue that that is about touching, or just like that. Our final numbers here are uh, zero degrees flexion extension, and then valgus is around two degrees. And so, you know, this anatomy to this knee is a little bit hypovalgus compared to the, the average human, but, you know, what a lot of anatomic cadaveric studies have shown is that, yes, there might be averages in varus valgus and internal external rotation, but the majority of humans don't fall into that exaverage. And so for those reasons, people who have gone on this quest to 
refined kinematic technique have, you know, again, use technologies such as this to recreate anatomic cuts that are more specific to the actual human that you're operating on. So now that we are satisfied with these paddles touching the cartilage on both the medial and femoral condyle, I'm going to go ahead and pin this distal femoral jig. So again, looking at the front of this femur, again, we have this medial side with a small little hole in it, which is insignificant. We're going to make a cut through that femur anyways. And if we look at some of these other areas, we have a little hole up here uh, just a centimeter above the insertion of the PCL. And just, you know, two little poke holes on the lateral uh, femoral condyle. But these are, are really tiny holes. These are not going to cause problems clinically. So now we have the uh, tibial jig assembled, and we're just going to follow the, the prompts for the tibial side. Generally, when we're doing a, a mechanical cut for a total or a partial knee in, in this situation, we want the varus valgus at zero degrees. So just for fun, we're going to put it at zero degrees. And again, this is very easily, you're very easily able to manipulate this just by grossly with your hand moving the whole jig. But here we are at about zero degrees, and I'm going to lock this into place just so we can compare where the standard cut would be in relationship to where I'm going to make the kinematic cut. 6.5 tends to work pretty well. And so I'm just manipulating the slope by pushing the buttons down here on the bottom aspect of this tibial jig. And here we are, we're at about 6.5. So now we have our standard mechanical cuts. We're doing a kinematic knee cut, so these numbers are not going to be so useful. We have our mechanical, anticipated mechanical cuts dialed in just for, for educational purposes. Now we're going to take off this proximal pointer. And I'm going to place the cutting jig in preparation for the proximal tibial cut. Now under normal circumstances, we would have never done this uh, registration on the femur. We would just start here, and if you were doing a mechanical partial knee replacement, you'd accept these numbers, pin it after assessing the amount of uh, resection for depth, and, and just move on. We're going to do something a little bit differently. So I'm going to bring the leg to extension, and what I want to bring to your attention is the relationship between these two jigs. We know that the distal femoral cut, which is the true cut for a kinematic joint, is parallel to the distal medial and lateral condyles. And if we're going to use this true cut to base our proximal tibial cut off of, then the kinematic cut is going to have to be parallel to this distal femur cut. And I'll point your eyes to the, the shape between these two. This is a trapezoid, right? This is flat and this is coming at, at a bit of an angle. And so if we were just to make this mechanical cut, we would have to do soft tissue releases on the medial side in order to recreate that perfect triangle. So what I'm going to simply do is unlock the varus valgus control, which is again independent of flexion and extension. And with the leg in extension, I'm simply going to manipulate it mildly so that we have a true rectangle. And now I'm going to lock it into place. It was a subtle manipulation, but now when you, you look at the relationship between these two jigs, it's a rectangle. This is going to be a balanced cut. So at this point, I'm going to bring back the knee and flex, and just for educational purposes, look at the varus valgus manipulation that's now going to be re-recorded and calibrated on the tibia. Uh, as a reminder, before we, we change the varus valgus in order to get this parallel relationship between the proximal tibial and distal femoral jig, we were at zero degrees varus valgus. I then manipulated it to get the parallel relationship, and you can see here we're somewhere between 2.5 and 3 degrees varus. The composite change is 3 degrees hypovalgus on the femur and 3 degrees varus on the tibia, and that makes sense. Some, some knees, again, not all knees read uh, Netter's textbook. Some don't always add up to this, but in this situation, we'll take advantage of it. We took 3 degrees off here and added 3 degrees here, so the net effect is going to be a rather neutral looking uh, joint. We're going to assess depth and pin the proximal tibial guide. All right, so my, my uh, resection guide is in place. Again, we have cartilage here because it's a non-arthritic specimen, but you know, generally with unis, you can only cut too much. So um, I would encourage you to cut not that much. And if you have to make a second cut, that's fine. So I'm taking this off. And now I'm just going to pin my jig. I like to use the bottom holes in case you want to drop it to uh, two millimeters. You can simply take off the jig and replace it. But again, we're looking at the computer. Our slope is undisturbed. Our varus valgus is, is undisturbed. And at this point, we can disassemble the tibial jig and, and get back to the partial knee replacement. So here we go. We've now you know, done the, the company-specific or device-specific cuts. We don't have a, a tibial tray, unfortunately. So we're just using this plastic insert, which reflects the 
anticipated thickness from the final tibial tray. We have full extension. We have stability varus valgus in extension. When I bring it up to flexion, same deal, completely stable. We've again cut the femur in a little bit less valgus and a little bit more varus on the tibia. We've done no resection of the collateral ligaments and this knee feels absolutely normal. I'm giving this a pivot shift. I'm looking at the ACL. It's providing interlateral rotational stability. This feels like a happy knee and this will be a happy knee. And I submit to you that if you're able to do these surgeries, partials and total knees without doing undue, unnecessary uh, cutting to collateral ligaments, that there's likely less post-operative pain and perhaps uh, better uh, functional outcomes. This is a fluoroscopy shot after we've applied the distal femur and proximal tibial jigs. The first thing I want to point out is this distal femoral jig. If you look at the amount of bone below the medial and lateral sides of this, it's about symmetric, which is good because, again, we're trying to really build everything off of this true distal femoral articulation. And then, of course, we're looking at this perfect rectangle, which will ensure that the, this construct will be stable in extension.